Welcome to Health Beat, a program on television and digital platforms worldwide. The show is produced by the Becky Sisa Center for Health Journalism in South Africa. I'm Mia Malan. Thank you for joining us. In June, the US government took a bold step. The first African head of the President's Emergency Plan for AIDS Relief, PEPFA, was sworn in. Johnny Kengasong is a virologist from Cameroon and the former head of the Africa Centers for Disease Control. The Kengasong is now the head of the world's largest government fund to fight HIV. He is of course also a US citizen, as this is the requirement for most American government jobs. PEPFA has invested more than 100 billion US dollars to fight HIV in over 50 countries, most of them in Africa. The fund was created in 2003. It has helped to reduce deaths on the continent and give Africa access to HIV treatment. But Nick Ngasong's appointment comes at a difficult time when the COVID-19 pandemic has stalled HIV efforts. The King Hassong will also have to deal with the potential impact of the recent change in abortion legislation in the US. Abortion is no longer a constitutional right in America. This could complicate things for PEPFAR. The program has to follow US laws because it's funded by the US government. Will this mean that PEPFAR will no longer be able to fund HIV projects who also support safe legal abortion? I sat down with Johnny Kengasong during his visit to Tswane in South Africa. I started off by asking him what lessons the United States can learn from Africa. If you look at HIV, for example, uh, Botswana, we just, uh, just announced that they had exceeded the 95-95-95 um, targets. That is 95% uh, of the population that uh, HIV infected lower their status, 95% of those uh, are on treatment and 95% of those uh, have viral load uh, that are uh, below detection level. That is a unique situation, if especially when you know where Botswana was a few years ago, the burden of the disease. The Omicron variant was identified by researchers in South Africa that's a lesson for the world, not just the United States, to learn how Africans work together in a network to identify the uh, emergence of such a new variant. Before BEPFAR, you were the head of the Africa CDC, and that was during another pandemic, COVID. How will you apply the lessons that you learned during that time to your new position in BEPFAR? There are so many parallels. Parallels in terms of knowing the pathogen, which in this case, HIV and COVID. COVID, we still continue to learn the variants. HIV has many subtypes. Having the right policies are very, very important. Politics. We saw in the COVID response how good politics can actually enhance the ability to fight the pandemic. We also saw across the board in many countries where bad politics didn't have the response. You've mentioned good politics now that can help a country fight a pandemic effectively. Is there an example in Africa of a country that used good politics to fight a pandemic? Let me come in at a regional level. President Ramaphosa was the chair of the African Union when COVID just hit. And I was the director of the Africa CDC. In my view, he has been, in my 32 years uh, uh, experience in Global had the most effective political leader in guiding the way and manner in which he guided the continental response. He convened his peers, head of states, nearly every month to discuss the pandemic. President Ramaphosa was the one who set up the African Vaccine Acquisition Task Force. He set up to promote vaccine acquisition on the continent. And through that initiative, 400 million doses of vaccines were acquired in Africa at a time where there were absolutely no vaccines for the continent. He set up the African Medicine uh, uh, Supply Platform, AMSP, which is a platform like Amazon.com where you could actually go there 
you click your products, put it into the basket, and you pay it, and you go. That's how we unlock the, the challenges that we had early on. So that is good policy. We are now in an area where we have multiple pandemics that often set back HIV efforts severely. So how will that influence your strategy to fight HIV? We saw during the COVID pandemic how disruptive it was to our ability to offer services to HIV uh, patients including enrolling new patients and even uh, dispensing uh, medication to patients that were on treatment. We also know that COVID infection in HIV patients with lower CD4 count, that is low levels of white blood cells, makes it difficult for them to fight the virus. That means we have to really look at health systems. How do we strengthen health systems that can protect the HIV gains by warding off any new infection or outbreak that occur very early enough so that it doesn't affect, affect HIV patients or disrupt HIV service delivery. That is one of the cornerstones of my reimagining uh, PEPFA going forward. How do we strengthen health systems that can fight HIV but position them in such a way that they can very quickly be used in responding to new disease outbreaks, i.e. monkeypox, COVID? If we look at the latest UNAIDS report, it is very clear that a big part of the answer of how to fight HIV successfully is to address inequality because it fuels the spread of HIV. How will you, as the African head of PEPFA, address inequality on our continent? Inequality, as uh, we have seen across our struggle, long struggle against HIV, is a serious barrier our ability to fight um, the disease. And each time we fail to address those inequalities and barriers, we have to look at a young population. HIV AIDS is a generational disease. The burden of the disease is in young people. We have to position them in a way that they can lead this response. That will lead to the, the, uh, the reduction of, of inequality that you just described. Political will is not enough, but political commitment and political leadership. HIV AIDS, unfortunately, these days you don't see it at the topmost agenda. We have a unique opportunity to address inequalities by making sure that the global fund is replenished at 18 billion in September. So making sure that the global fund is replenished fully at 18 billion will have enable us with the resources to continue to address some of the inequalities. You've mentioned now that political will is not enough, that we need political commitment. If we look at Africa, what can African leaders themselves do to show more com political commitment when it comes to fighting HIV? Many countries in Africa are already showing uh, strong political commitment and political will and leadership. South Africa contributes about 77% of the resources that are required to fight in HIV AIDS. Botswana similarly contributes in excess of 80% of the resources that is required in fighting HIV AIDS. We want to see more. Is that trend across the board and in Africa? No. We want to see those countries that have not leveraged their own domestic resources step up to the plate and say, this is about our people. And we will have to do this in partnership with PEPFA, with Global Fund, but we have to increase our own uh, uh, resource envelope. We now also have an HIV prevention injection that works even better than the HIV prevention pill. But it's very expensive. And even though the manufacturers have said that they will make it available for cheaper to many countries in Africa until we have generics, we still don't know at which price. What is it that PEPFAR can do to work with pharmaceutical companies to essentially get them to behave better? One thing we should always remember is that PEPFA cannot do it alone. So it means uh, we have to always rely on the power of partnerships, of collaboration. And for the new long-acting PrEP, we, PEPFA, are already in discussion with multiple groups that we are going to sit down around the same table and look at ways to shape the market in terms of guaranteeing volumes, ensuring that ways that the price can be reduced. Remember, in this fight against HIV AIDS, this is not the first time we are dealing with a drug that comes into the market at very high level. ARVs, 
when they were first introduced in uh, 1996, it used to cost $10,000 per year per patient for treatment. But look at where we are today. So I'm optimistic that if we bring ourselves together, bring the, the right partners together, we can actually sit down with, with that, that company and look at ways that we can bring the prices down because uh, it looks like uh, that uh, the long-acting injectable prep can actually be a game changer if we bring the prices down. How long do you think those negotiations will take until we see that injection in Africa? I think it's quite, it's quite urgent. I don't think uh, that we are talking of years. I think it should be a question of uh, we should aggressively work on it as a priority so that in, uh, in months, not years, we should begin to see that happen and to uh, translate that very important finding into uh, programming. Another issue that is uh, so closely related to HIV is reproductive rights. And it's so closely related to young women's vulnerability to, uh, to get infected with HIV. And I'm talking about things like contraception, but also safe abortion access. And that is, of course, a little bit of a controversial issue in the US at the moment because of the overturning of the Roe v. Wade um, ruling. How do you see those rights playing out in the PEPFAR program? Well, the PEPFAR program is governed by laws, by the, the, the laws of the United States. So I think we'll continue to implement PEPFAR as guided by the laws in, in, in the United States. I think that is, we have, over the, the course of um, the years, uh, followed the, the rules, the regulations, and the laws that govern what we do. So I think uh, we will be uh, looking at that very closely and also working in partnership with the, the, the partner countries that we work in uh, so that if there are things that we cannot do with PEPFA programming, then the countries can also uh, lead in that in that direction because countries are sovereign in, the, in whatever they, they, they have to do or look for additional partners that can leverage the limits on or uh, work with us to complete areas that PEPFA cannot uh, provide a funding in. So what does that mean for PEPFAR? How will that play out? Remember, the recent changes in the U.S. are very new. And we, we in PEPFAR have still to discuss that and ask questions where, for clarity where, where needs uh, exist. During COVID, we often saw that when research was conducted by African countries, that Western countries sometimes didn't take it as seriously as they took the research from the global north. What do you think about the HIV world? Do the Western countries take research that comes from Africa seriously enough? My views in this, based on my own personal experience, uh, as someone of African origin, is that, uh, yes, colleagues in uh, the advanced countries do respect scientists a lot from, from Africa. Is there room for improvement? Yes, there's room for improvement. But room for improvement should be on both ways. African scientists should also be able to promote their own findings. Create platforms that you can actually use those platforms to promote their findings. For example, have an African respected journal where you can publish high quality data from the continent. Have important conferences where African scientists can share that information that are regional. When I was at the US CDC to, to, to address some of those gaps, I created the African Society for Lab Medicine. I believe that was in 2011. I became the premier platform for sharing laboratory uh, knowledge and science. We also created the journal, the Journal of uh, uh, Public Health in, uh, in Africa and the Journal of Laboratory Medicine in Africa. Top notch journal where Africans could uh, uh, publish their findings there and disseminate it across the continent. So it's a two-way process. My thinking and advice to African scientists is, is that count on your own strength, count on your networking, create platforms that can promote uh, 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 your, your science and learn from each other. If you do that, countries in, in Europe, United States, Asia will be eager to come learn from, from Africa. Ambassador, on a personal level, you were based in Africa now, and now you live in Washington, D.C. What will you miss about life in Africa? Uh, a lot. A lot about uh, the warmness, the diversity of culture, 
Uh, in Africa, uh, uh, each time I traveled from one country to another, it was very different, but it was very similar. The warmness was that was there. The warmness, not just in in temperature, but the warmness of the heart. Uh, uh, people uh, were willing to share whatever they, they had, that ability to always be happy, even when people just didn't have enough. And lastly, the eagerness for the young people to grow in their careers, for the young people to back in their scientific journey was remarkable. Young people are yearning to, to enrich their knowledge base, to grow uh, their capacity and capabilities. I will miss that a lot. That was John Ekengesong, the head of the U.S. government's AIDS fund, PEPFAR. Remember, you can also catch more content on health matters on our website, or you can follow us on Twitter. Until next time, be safe and go well.